Welcome to this week's episode of The Read Out Loud, a weekly biotech podcast from STAT. I'm Meg Terrell. I'm Adam Feuerstein. And I'm Damian Garde. It's Thursday, April 20th, and here's what we're going to talk about this week. COVID! Uh, no, we're not kidding. Uh, the U.S. just made another round of boosters available to the most vulnerable in the population, and STAT's Helen Branswell joins us on that and more. Next, a deeply reported story by Adam and Stats Jason Mast revealed divisions at the FDA over the Duchenne muscular dystrophy gene therapy in development at Sarepta. We'll discuss. We'll start with a look at the rest of the week's biggest news in biopharma, from M&A to the retirement of perhaps the most storied executive in the business. But first, a word from our sponsor. I'm Stat Branded Content Editor Jesse McQuarters. With its talent, lab space, and robust startup ecosystem, New York City is now a global life sciences hub. I'm joined by Sue Rosenthal, SVP of Life Sciences and Healthcare at New York City Economic Development Corporation, to hear more about New York's life sciences capabilities. Sue, can you tell us about this competitive edge that New York has? New York City has nine premier academic medical centers and over two and a half billion dollars of NIH funding that we've secured recently. The city has a thriving ecosystem for life sciences. Part of that is that we're committed to nurturing and growing the city's diverse and skilled talent with initiatives like the Life Science New York City Internship Program, which has paired over 600 interns with at least 160 host companies. And how can people find out more? The best place is online at lifesci.nyc. L-I-F-E-S-C-I dot N-Y-C. So guys, this was a pretty busy week for biotech bankers. Damien, maybe tell us about some of the deal news we got. That's right. It began this week or actually over the weekend uh, with the news that Merck is paying nearly $11 billion for a company called Prometheus Biosciences, which is developing a uh, autoimmune treatment um, with a few different uh, potential indications and, and thus could be could eventually be worth that large sum of money. And then likewise, uh, GSK, the former GlaxoSmithKline, is paying about $2 billion for a company called Bellis Health that I think we've talked about on this podcast before, but probably it was years ago, which is developing a treatment for chronic cough, which is a bigger scourge than, than you might think uh, just hearing that here. And so, I mean, those two things in in combination, they're just like simple data points, but it did seem to improve biotech sentiment, that that like fickle thing that we often talk about, both as measured by stock prices, but also just like the reactions to the deal, I think in part because, you know, Bellis is a company that's really been through it in the process of developing this cough medicine. Um, and Prometheus, similarly, a company that um, has been around for a little a little while, and there's been some debate over the underlying science of its approach to treating disease. And so these two deals felt like both, you know, major pharma companies uh, lending credence to some biotech ideas, and also just reminders that sometimes big deals with big premiums can still happen. And that in itself seemed encouraging to people in the field. Yeah, and there's some, we can put some numbers to this, uh, Damien and Meg. Uh, $64 billion in deals through, I guess, through the middle of April. That's uh, from records kept by Torea, which is like a market research research firm. You know, there's always that sort of on pace. Uh, if if these if this deal flow continues, uh, we are on pace for about a $300 billion M&A year, which, you know, would, would be among the highest that the industry has ever seen. Now, obviously, we don't know if we're going to remain on that pace and likely will not. But again, you know, this is, uh, as Damien said, I think this does um, kind of uh, make everyone very happy uh, and it improves sentiment. Uh, it, you know, it's also interesting. These are two companies in Prometheus and in Bellis that are kind of have drugs in the mid stage or late stage uh, development. So, you know, we're not talking about uh, big pharma buying approved drugs, you know, which is what happened when Pfizer bought Cgen, you know, this is, they're, you know, they're essentially buying risk here, right? They're buying drugs that look really promising, that have potential for maybe potentially for, you know, billion dollar plus sales, but have uh, a little bit of ways to go to, to prove that. So that's also, I think, uh, made, you know, improved sentiment because you're seeing, you know, pharma companies willing to sort of take on that risk. So we've been looking at this from, you know, the biotech side, which is think looking upon this very favorably. Uh, there was an interesting story from Bloomberg's Ed Hammond that um, he's a deals reporter, I believe, um, that 
Damien linked to in the readout um, newsletter, which I thought was really interesting. It was sort of looking at it from the farmer perspective. And he was suggesting that these deals and perhaps the premiums being paid um, suggest that pharma companies are looking increasingly desperate to buy, you know, new revenue streams, essentially, because they're facing big patent cliffs and losses of their own revenue. What do you guys make of that uh, sort of lens on what's going on? Well, that's certainly true with Merck, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, everyone looks at Merck, uh, they they think about Keytruda, their, their cancer immunotherapy, you know, one of the biggest uh, selling drugs of all time. Uh, that is going off patent in, uh, I think it's two, I think it's 2028, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Merck has been, uh, you know, out there looking for ways to diversify its revenue stream to sort of replace the revenue that it may lose when Keytruda goes generic. And, um, you know, with this deal with Prometheus, what's interesting is, you know, they're kind of getting into an area in uh, autoimmune diseases that other pharma companies are already deeply entrenched. And Merck, mm-hmm. has, has, Merck has done a little bit of work in, uh, in autoimmune disease, but it really has not been the, as involved. So, you know, this deal obviously signals that they're, they're getting into it deeper. Uh, but again, you know, the revenue that may come from those drugs uh, if they are approved, will help them offset losses that they might have when uh, Keytruda goes generic. Yeah, I thought it was a fair observation, but also in many ways kind of felt like a return to form, or at least the pharma biotech dynamic we're used to from years past, the massive patent cliffs of the 2000s that led to consolidation, both both in terms of pharma buying biotech companies and also pharma companies merging with one another and laying off like hundreds of people. I There's a reasonable debate to be had as to one whether whether it does indeed reflect poor R and D decisions within these large companies that they're having to look externally for these things, but also as to whether it is actually good for science and for patients. Um, you know, we talked about how it improves biotech sentiment for people who are employees of or investors in biotech companies, but you know, there's a lot of I wouldn't say conflicting evidence, but there's murky evidence as to whether consolidation and mergers of drug companies actually accelerate the path of new medicines to the market. So while this is all, as Adam, as you mentioned, a wonderful time for bankers, um, we'll see whether these drugs really, in fact, uh, are better off in the hands of larger firms than they would have been in the ones that invented them. So at the top of the podcast, we noted the uh, retirement of a storied healthcare biopharma executive. Uh, Meg, tell us about that. Yeah, it's uh, Roy Vagelos, um, who, you know, when he gets when people talk about him being this you know legendary CEO, and in fact, Matt Herper suggested on Twitter that that was an understatement when I called him that. Um, and then John Maraginore, um called him, you know, the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Um, you know, he was the CEO of Merck uh, and, you know, was just looked to as uh, this, you know, fantastic leader who, you know, came from the world of medicine, really focused on R&D um, and was extremely productive in that. And since then, he was the chairman of Regeneron. Um, he's now 93. And the news this week is that he's retiring from that post. Um, and Len Schleifer and George Yankopoulos, the uh, duo of, you know, probably everybody's favorite duo in biotech. Now I want to think of some other duos in biotech. <laughs> but um, they are going to go lead the board of Regeneron as Roy Vagelos uh, retires from that position. But I, I think maybe it's kind of looked at as, as a general re- retirement for him. And I don't know if that's totally fair. Um this was, you know, his last like big post, as far as I know, in the industry. But, you know, since he left Merck, he's really been a voice uh, for sort of a more ethical, a, a more sort of, you know, positive force in society uh, role for the pharmaceutical industry than I think he, you hear from a lot of people. You know, he speaks very differently about um, how the industry should price medicines. He's he's consistently spoken out against the pattern of raising drug prices by double digits every year. Um, you know, he just thinks you have to, you know, invent good new drugs in order to grow your business, not grow your business by raising prices. Um, and of course, the the story about uh, the collaboration with Jimmy Carter um, and Merck working to try to eradicate river blindness um, in Africa uh, is a main story that people remember about Roy Vagelos. Um, Adam, you know, you 
Did you cover Merck while he was CEO? You know, I really, I really didn't uh, back then. I was kind of more biotech focused. But I think you know, you you brought up the the river blindness uh, drug treatment that that he helped champion. You know, it's interesting, right? Because he did that at the same time. You know, while he was at Merck, uh, Merck developed Zocor. You know, the cholesterol treatment, which mm-hmm. was one of their top selling drugs of all time. So you can kind of see he's you know he's doing a little bit of both, right? He's he's developing a, obviously a very important you know, medicine so core for patients, but but one that, you know, brought in billions and billions of dollars for Merck as a very successful commercial product, but also doing something on more philanthropic. This week, the FDA and CDC signed off on an additional round of COVID boosters for people 65 and up and those who are immunocompromised. Stats Helen Branswell, as usual, was way ahead of the game on this story, noting a month ago that a small but determined group of people was frustrated with the agency's radio silence on the issue, particularly as Canada and the UK had already announced plans for spring boosters. Helen joins us now. Helen, welcome back to The Read Out Loud. Hey, guys. It's been a while. Indeed. And, you know, we keep hearing that the COVID emergency is ending, but this signals that regulators think at least some people still need more frequent protection from vaccines. What was the rationale for this decision? You know, it's not super clear. I mean, the evidence at this point is that when you get a a COVID shot, a booster at this point, the protection it offers wears off fairly quickly, at least in terms of um, any infection. That that doesn't last very long at all. Uh, There is evidence that protection against like really severe outcomes is pretty good at this point. But it is also true that, you know, as we look at who is landing in hospital at this point with COVID, it's people 65 and over and it's generally speaking and and people who are immunocompromised. So I think the thinking is that uh, you could top up their immunity a bit more, um, you know, in the period between now and next fall, when it's expected that everybody will be offered another booster. And you mentioned, you know, the people who are ending up in the hospital right now. What what do the numbers generally look like with COVID, both in terms of, you know, cases from what we can tell and, you know, more severe disease and deaths? So I read something the other day that suggested the numbers are lower than they than they've been for quite a long time. It's very hard to know how many people are catching COVID at this point because home tests have effectively uh, made you know a lot of the iceberg invisible. Um, but wastewater uh, numbers are down, and in terms of deaths, which are you know easier to to count still, um, they're still higher than you would have thought this far into uh, into an event like this. I mean, I think I, I read about thirteen hundred people a week dying, which is not insignificant. The FDA also retired the original COVID vaccine formulations, right? Tell, tell us about that decision. If you were um, either a pharmacy or, you know, working in the doctor's office and you were administering COVID vaccine, it's been a mess for quite a while. You know, there are multiple dosages for adults 18 and older, for um, kids um, six months to four years for Pfizer, six months to five years for Moderna, five years to 12, five years to 11. You you could have had all sorts of different types of vials in your fridge with different labels and colored uh, caps. Uh, in fact, you know, it's been reported that a lot of people only stocked one type of vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna, because to have both would have required too much fridge space, effectively. Mm. At this point, what they're trying to do is make things a lot simpler for everybody involved. So now going forward, anybody who's never been vaccinated before will get the bivalent vaccine, not the monovalent vaccine, which if you believe, you know, the bivalent vaccine is needed, it makes perfect sense. And, um, Uh, going forward, what is quite interesting about this is that, you know, if 
except for small children, going forward, if somebody comes forward and says, I've never been vaccinated, I want to be vaccinated, they only need one dose at this point. The conclusion has has been instead of, you know, a primary series of two doses and then the, you know, two, three, four um, booster doses, what the CDC is now and the FDA are now saying is that one dose is sufficient. The reason behind that is that the thinking is that virtually everybody in the population at this point has some immunity against uh, the SARS-2 virus, whether that's vaccine-induced, infection-induced, or hybrid immunity, which is, you know, a combination of having been exposed to um, the SARS-2 spike protein through vaccine and through infection. Everybody has layers of inf- of protection at this point, and so you don't need to uh, first vaccinate people with a bunch of vaccines, one will do. So on that topic, looking forward and under the, I think, pretty reasonable assumption that SARS-2 is going to be with us with some for some time, the plan for future boosters sounds like it's expected to look something like it does for annual flu vaccines. What's your expectation of how that system will work for COVID? Um, yeah, that's very much the way FDA is steering the ship at this point. Um, they've said that they'll have a meeting in June to do strain selection to see whether or not the the strains that are in the bivalent vaccine should be updated or I guess maybe even added to. And, um, and then their thought is that that new formulation should be available in September for the rollout of uh, COVID and flu vaccines. You'll remember last fall, uh, Ashish Jha, the White House um, COVID czar, uh, suggested that we had two arms. God gave us two arms, one for flu vaccine, one for COVID vaccine. (laughs) I think very much that the thinking is that, you know, you could make life a lot easier for physicians and people working in long-term care facilities, et cetera, if you could uh, co-administer these vaccines together, flu and and COVID. Whether that is going to be what is done over the long term remains to be seen. It may effectively become the default uh, situation. But I think the question of how often we need to be vaccinated against COVID and and how serious infection will be, you know, a few years from now, for instance, when most of us have even more layers of, of uh, immunity. Uh, that's, those are still unanswered questions. So, Helen, we also wanted to ask you about another virus, um, Marburg, and the outbreak in Equatorial Guinea. You've been writing about this. Tell us about this disease and how concerning the situation is. So Marburg is a philo is caused by a filovirus, uh, same family as Ebola, and it behaves very similarly to Ebola. I mean, symptomatically, it's the same. Um, you know, it has a very high death rate. Um, Marburg, the outbreaks haven't been as frequent as Ebola, and they're typically smaller. You know, people who work in the field think there's something about this virus that makes it less well-equipped than Ebola for spreading person to person. Uh, Most of the outbreaks have been sort of single digits as opposed to into the dozens or hundreds, or in in the case of a few of the Ebola outbreaks, thousands of cases. Uh, Right now, there are 39 confirmed and... um, uh, probable cases in this outbreak, of whom I think uh, 34 or so have, have died. I find it worrisome, and I'm not alone in this, because Equatorial Guinea has never before handled an, uh, a filovirus outbreak. It doesn't have the years of experience with these kinds of viruses as, say, the Democratic Republic of the Congo does. And, um, you know, Handling a filovirus outbreak is not like handling a measles outbreak or anything else. It really requires um, special approaches. And uh, it seems that the government is not necessarily fully apprised of how serious this could become. They uh, really have been downplaying it. They, The message that they've been trying to convey is 
we're in the mop up phase. But, you know, there was a case that was uh, confirmed yesterday, so clearly they're not. The other thing is um, a number of the cases, um, well, first of all, there are cases in multiple parts of the country. And um, for some of the cases, they don't know how the people became infected, which tells you that there are chains of transmission that they aren't detecting and, uh, you know, the possibility of additional cases. So it's kind of worrisome. Worrisome for the people there and for the neighboring countries. But it's not likely to be something that, you know, countries outside of that part of Africa are going to have to deal with. I mean, there, you know, conceivably could be exported cases to to neighboring countries, and, and certainly they are on the lookout for that. But it's not, this is not something that's going to show up in Dallas, for mm, instance. Like in Ebola did. Ebola did, yeah, in 2014. Helen, thank you as always for joining us. Thanks for having me. So guys, last week I awoke to a text message from somebody in the biotech world that said just two words, holy crap. So of course I frantically checked my email to see what news I'd already missed. I texted back asking what they were talking about and they said, the stat story on Sarepta. So Adam, Damien and I briefly talked about your piece last week while you were out, but now you've got an even bigger one about Sarepta to discuss. Uh, these were both things you wrote along with colleague Jason Mast. So maybe let's start at the beginning. What did you guys set out to do with this story and why focus on this drug in particular? Yeah, sorry I wasn't around last week to help you guys talk about this because I was busy working on this story. Um, yeah, you know, I, th I think we set out you know, we looked at this uh, in, a, in a few different ways, but, you know, we've talked about the importance of gene therapy and kind of the importance this year in gene therapy in that, you know, for years we've looked at them as uh, products that were in clinical development, sort of unproven. And, and this is a pivotal year for gene therapy because we have a bunch of them sort of moving through the FDA. Some of them have already been approved and launched. So we, we sort of thought that this it was a really good time to kind of really deep dig deep into gene therapy. And we look, we chose, I guess, Sarepta Therapeutics and its gene therapy for Duchenne muscular dystrophy because it is, well, we call it the, we call it one of the most common rare diseases uh, because there are, you know, tens of thousands of boys. It, this is a, this is a disease that is caused, caused by a mutation on the X chromosome. So it, it happens almost always in boys who are born with this disease. And so for the first time we're going, we're going to have, or the potential to have a genetic medicine, sort of a fix for this, uh, for this mutation that causes Duchenne. Uh, and so it was a really good time to sort of look at it because it was a, it's a pivotal moment for the, for, for boys who are born with Duchenne, for the community. Um, and obviously for the company itself, Sarepta has been around uh, for a long time. Uh, this is a potentially a blockbuster product for them. Uh, one that if they get approved will likely make them profitable for the first time in 40 plus years. So we really wanted to kind of tell the story of kind of how gene therapy came to be in Duchenne and the story of how Sarepta sort of embraced gene therapy uh, and has pushed this uh, have pushed this treatment, you know, to the FDA. Well, in that latter part, I mean, we can't recapitulate the entire story on this podcast. People should go read it. Uh, you, in fact, you can pause this now and do that and then come back. But the latter part, the FDA is so key to this, which is sort of a stupid statement. They're key to every drug review. But in particular, <laughs> um, with this company and this indication, and that's one of the fascinating things about your story is you lay out the very long path that this particular gene therapy has taken to get to this point, much of which happens external to Sarepta. But the sort of Sarepta of it all is particularly fascinating because of the company's prior experience at the FDA. So you can tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, what makes this application to the FDA different is, you know, this is the first time that a company has asked the agency to uh, to grant accelerated approval to a gene therapy, you know, based on essentially based on a surrogate biomarker. Uh, you know, we we see a lot of drugs who are that are approved. You know, it's 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 a it's a pathway that was started uh, back with HIV, and and we probably know it most commonly for cancer drugs. It's used, and but this is the first time that anyone has seen or anyone tried to get 
a, a gene therapy approved under accelerated approval. So from that point, uh, from that point of view, it's very noteworthy. The Sarepta backstory is interesting because, uh, you know, we have to go back to 2016 when Sarepta was developing its first uh, treatment for Duchenne. Uh, it's a drug called Ateplersin. It, it works by essentially skipping over the mutation to make small amounts of this protein called dystrophin that is a, a, an essential sort of it's an essential sort of muscle lubricant. You know, they also sought accelerated approval for that drug. The, the, the clinical data to support that was, let's just call it sort of mixed, iffy. Uh, there was a lot of debate about whether or not the drug worked or not. Uh, and uh, But patients uh, and patient advocacy groups were pushing very hard, lobbying the FDA to approve this drug. And what we had, what happened, that it was very controversial approval, where essentially there was a, you know, there was a, an advisory committee meeting that voted against the approval. There was uh, staff within the FDA who did not think that ateplosin should have been approved, but a top official at the FDA essentially overruled those objections and approved the drug. So, you know, we kind of describe that as Sarepta sort of pushing the limits of the FDA when it came with respect to Ateplersin back in 2016. And, you know, here they are doing it again with their gene therapy. You know, the other sort of backstory there, and we can kind of get into this, is there's a lot of mistrust, frankly, within certain uh, spheres inside the FDA. Distrust of Sarepta in that they have never, well, to, to date, they have still not um, completed the confirmatory studies required of companies when they get a drug approved under accelerated approval, right? You have to do a study to confirm the benefit. Uh, and to this day, uh, you know, uh, Ateplosin and the other two drugs that Sarepta have approved, those confirmatory studies have not been completed. And why not? Like, is is it thought that the company is, is in good faith running these trials and it's just taking a long time? Or is it that, you know, they don't really have an incentive to, to get this information as one thing you point out, which I think is just so interesting in the story is like Sarepta has been on the brink a number of times. And, you know, if they didn't have the revenue coming in from these uh, approved drugs, then perhaps they wouldn't have gotten to this point with the gene therapy. But do the approved drugs actually work is a key question. Why haven't they finished the trials? Well, that's a great question. It took it took Sarepta almost four years to actually start the confirmatory study for Ateplosin. And, and I don't want to relitigate Ateplosin in this discussion. And we tried not to do it <laughs> in our in our story this week, although it's really hard not to do. Um, but, you know, I, it, it comes down to that essential argument, right, is if, if you give a company an accelerated approval, which, you know, lets them... Uh, market a drug, uh, generate revenue based on preliminary evidence, you know, there is that requirement. And, you know, and then that will allow the drug to get full approval. And it, and if that confirmatory study does not work, then, you know, I, ideally the drug should be pulled off the market because patients aren't benefiting from it. So I think, you know, the, that's one of the questions with this accelerated approval for gene therapy. It, you know, it, it almost, it raises the bar a little bit because unlike other drugs that if they don't work, patients can stop taking them. With a gene therapy, it's a permanent treatment, right? You get a gene therapy one time, uh, and it's supposed to be a permanent fix for whatever disease is being targeted. You can't pull that back, right? So uh, the stakes are just a little bit higher here for a gene therapy. And it's so interesting that that kind of grand bargain, um, Meg, that you alluded to of basically had the FDA not eventually approved Ateplersin and Sarepta's later medicines, it seems like the company would have become insolvent and maybe have disappeared by now and thus would not have been able to make the investments leading to this gene therapy. And I've seen people kind of point that out as exonerating. That's probably maybe too strong a word, but as as suggesting that the FDA's initial decision on Ateplersin was wise given this context. But I, I don't know, that seems like kind of a tough thing to call, both because you know the FDA doesn't exist to shepherd along companies that may in the future do something valuable that isn't that isn't their charter as far as I'm aware. And furthermore, as you mentioned, this gene therapy, the evidence presented to the FDA now is again a little unclear. And and there is legitimate debate over whether it is enough um, to lead to this or, or to justify an accelerated approval. And that the holy crap of it all was indeed the internal machinations of the FDA that you reported on, which make clear that you know this is not 
this is the subject of debate both you know here on this podcast and in science and in biotech, but also in the most important place, which is the agency that will decide on whether to approve this medicine. And then also for the families, I mean, just to just to piggyback on that point, you know, most you know, importantly is the, the patients and the families who are considering whether to take this. And so they have to make that decision, too. And I loved how you illustrated the, the sort of divide in the community over, you know, from the patient perspective and the family perspective of like, do you want to take a drug at this stage of evidence, um, you know, in in trying to help with this disease, maybe families with younger boys who, you know, could, you know, it could make a huge difference in their lives might be willing to take more of a risk um, than people who are farther along. I thought that was really fascinating, too. Yeah, we talked to a lot of people for the story. Obviously, uh, it's 7,200 words. <laughs> um, it's a long <laughs> story. But uh, we yeah, we did. We talked to, you know, we talked to scientists and we talked. We, did, we definitely spent a lot of time talking to families in the Duchenne community, and you know, our the the family that we saw highlight at the top of the story, uh, a, a young boy who was in the trial, um, and that's kind of the ideal case because you know this gene therapy, it's the word cure is not used here because it's really not a cure. What what is happening here is you know this if this works the way people think it should work is that this gene therapy will basically help the body make this protein called dystrophin. Uh, and therefore, so if you're young enough where, um, you know, you have not lost a lot of muscle function, because what, 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 what this gene therapy does not do, it does not restore muscle function that is already lost. It can only preserve the muscle function that exists. So ideally, a, a young, a young boy, let's say three, four years old, who, you know, who hasn't really lost a lot of muscle function yet, gets this gene therapy. And, and that boy could potentially, you know, live a normal life. Uh, now, we don't know how long, you know, the durability of gene therapy is one of those, is always one of those open questions because you just, you have to just wait and see and follow, follow the patients to see how long these things last. Um, but the potential is there for a younger, uh, you know, a younger boy to, you know, essentially not, you know, because who will have already has, uh, you know, sufficient muscle muscle function has not sort of, you know, hasn't lost that, that that will be preserved. Uh, you know, for older boys, it's a, it's a little bit of a different equation. Um, but still, there could be benefit there, potentially, e even for boys who have already sort of lost the ability to walk, let's say people, uh, boys who are already in wheelchairs, because there, maybe what you'll be doing is, you're just sort of halting the progression of the disease or, or significantly slowing the progression of the disease so that, you know, their loss of mus muscle function doesn't accelerate, it doesn't continue. One of the things I think you noted in the story, which I thought was interesting, is the the first approval would be for only for boys who can still walk. Is that right? And that's why right. is that? Because it was that's where it's studied in. And again, to the point I just mm -hmm. made, it you know it was studied in in ambulatory boys, boys who still have the ability to walk. Now they are doing work. Uh, we did we talked to a mom who has who has actually has two. Uh, two sons with Duchenne. Uh, one of them, both of them are in wheelchairs. Uh, one of them who actually got the gene therapy as part of a kind of an add-on study or an additional study that they are doing in non-ambulatory boys. So it's going to be some time before we learn definitively whether this gene therapy works as well as it seems to or as many hope that it does. But what we will learn much sooner is whether the FDA will approve it. And then before that, next month, Will there be a public hearing in which the agency and Sarepta will discuss the data, but maybe more, I don't want to say more importantly, but uh, I think what, what I think will be very striking is the testimony from patients and families uh, who are, are affected by Duchenne. So what are you expecting going into May? Yeah, I know you guys touched on this last week, uh, you know, the story, the, the kind of the... <laughs> the oh my god story that we <laughs> that we wrote last week uh you know a reporting kind of the first time this this real division within the FDA over whether or not uh this application sort of meets the the threshold uh, for accelerated approval and we're going to have this advisory panel meeting on May 12th where outside experts are going to be invited by the FDA to basically weigh the 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 data presented to them on on this gene therapy, both the efficacy data and and the safety data, and to sort of you know probably, you know whether there's a vote on kind of an outright recommendation for approval or not, we're not sure. But you know the discussion and the debate that we have heard is will will focus on you know this idea of whether or not, and it's 
technically a micro dystrophin. It's a miniaturized version of this dystrophin that the that the gene therapy makes. Whether that is reasonably likely to confer benefit for patients, and that is going to be the centerpiece of this advisory panel meeting. And it'll, it'll be a very very important meeting. Damien, as you mentioned, uh, you know these meetings uh, always have a a public hearing portion where the the general public, patients, patient advocates, scientists, uh, just whoever wants to speak is is allowed to speak. And so I anticipate that you will see, you know, a strong showing of support for the accelerated approval of this gene therapy from uh, from the Duchenne community. Uh, Meg, you mentioned that, you know, in our part of our story, we did talk to some, some mom, we talked to at least one mom, uh, and I know there are others out there uh, of of boys with gene therapy who who have some concerns, uh, mostly around the safety and the durability of this treatment, and sort of you know do do we have enough evidence today to to feel confident about this treatment, and you know those those views may also be reflected uh, at the the May twelfth advisory panel meeting. I was at the 2016 um, advisory committee meeting for Sarepta, um, you know, the Interplerson, and it was, you know, when the vote was negative, it was, it was absolutely the most emotional, you know, ad com I've ever been to. Families were crying. There were, you know, kids there uh, in wheelchairs with DMD. It was awful. Um, and then, of course, you know, the FDA turned around and, and approved the drug. I wouldn't be surprised, Adam, you sort of hinted at it there that, you know, there might not be a vote at this one because, you know, Rob Califf, when he was on uh, with us a month or two ago, or I guess probably just a month ago, um, you know, he said he didn't like votes at the end of advisory committee meetings because that's all people focus on. So maybe this one will really be more about the discussion and we won't end the day with the yes or no vote from the committee. The parallels to 2016 are so striking, though, because as you reported, lower level staffers at the FDA may not be on board with this. The head of the division of CBER, Dr. Peter Marks, is the one supporting this. 2016, it was the head of CEDAR, Dr. Janet Woodcock, who was supporting it. Rob Califf was the FDA <laughs> commissioner in 2016. He's the FDA commissioner now, and his whole protocol is to defer to the FDA staff who make these decisions. He's talked about it a lot publicly. So I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. It is so crazy how history repeats itself. When we started the reporting on this on this project, it you know was like kind of back in I guess late January. We talked about what we wanted, the scope of the project, what we wanted to do, and and I had mentioned to my partner, uh, my reporting partner Jason Mass, who just did a great job uh, on this on this work, uh, and his you know he's just a great writer, and so a lot of the best lines in the story when you read it, those those are Jason Mass lines, and I have to give him credit for that. Um, but you know we <laughs> talked about it, like we we kept saying like we don't want to relitigate. A Teplerson. We don't want to relitigate. We don't want to go back to 2016 because so much of so much has already been written about that. And we really wanted to focus on the gene therapy. But it it turns out that like there's no way that you can tell a story about Sarepta or gene therapy without going back to that 2016 uh, episode and the, particularly that advisory panel. So yeah, here we are. It's like it's, history is just repeating itself. That does it for another episode of The Read Out Loud. Thank you to Teresa Gaffney for producing this week's episode. Our senior producers are Hyacinth Ebonato and Alyssa Ambrose. Our executive producer is Rick Burke. And our theme music is by Brian Joel. And we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you like about this week's episode, what you didn't like, and who you think is the most famous duo in biotech. You can do all of that by sending us an email at readoutloud at statnews.com. And if you like what we do, leave a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever platform you use to get your podcasts. See you next week.